where you've got no idea. It could be recording, and if it is recording, it's going to record a presentation on functional style sheets. Uh, functional style sheets, oh, before we get to that far, g'day. Um, this is me, oh, hang on. Do you know what I've done? So professional. I was going to tell you that, oh no, I am being quite professional, surprisingly. Um, there's often another thing in there as well, but it's not there right now. Um, I was going to tell you that this is me. I'm a developer, advocate, uh, author, and teacher. And I had a thing in there as well that started with a P, but I can't remember what it was. No. No. Who? Not a professor. That'd be good if I was a professor. Um, but that's fine. This is me anyway. Um, I don't always wear red and blend into the background of a CJS presentation slide, so I'm glad I'm doing, not doing this tonight. But I have got these on my arm still, so you can tell it's me, um, although my watch has changed. Um, the presentation tonight is one that, uh, it's a cut down version of one that I gave at Web Directions this year. Um, I've been lucky enough to be involved in the web community for quite a long time. Um, back before Web Directions was Web Directions, back when it was uh, a, a other things that were in the minds of those gentle people. Um, but across the course of those many years, I started working on the web in 95. I've learned some things. This is intriguing. I'm gonna, hang on a second. Right. It's not June, is it? So if I go back into here and file open recent, not June but instead August, and things will become much clearer. Can we just edit this bit out so I look great? <laughs> Seriously. Patrick Wood? Oh. Patrick? <laughs> no support. Right, there's a P, I'm a presenter. Obviously. <laughs> Um, I've spoken Web Directions, and I've learned some things across the last 20-something years, um, and here are some of them. I'm being helped tonight by a mascot, um, because I can't do these things by myself. He is going to take us through three different steps of, of things that I've learned in the last 20-odd years. The first one involves bananas, which is, of course, why he was so keen to help out. In around 2016... This man came to Australia, and I was hoping that, um, well, you might know who he is. You know who he is? Yeah. Those folks down the back. Sharpie, you know who he is. <laughs> who is it? Sharpie? Yes, I know that bit. And he runs clear left. And his name's Jeremy... Keith, Jeremy Keith. Oh, thank you. Jeremy Keith. And he came out in 2016 and he told us a thing about a banana. How many people in this room, when they open a banana, go for that bit? Many people? Yeah. I did. I was like, at that point, I've been around for like 50 years. That's how you did a banana. His point was, you should instead go for this end of a banana. Exactly. Or other monkeys. Um, there's pictorial evidence of monkeys eating bananas from the non-woody end. And if you're going to put the thing in your mouth to open it up, not putting the wood bit in your mouth makes a whole bunch of sense. So at that point in time, I'd been about, I was about 50. I'd been eating bananas for about 50 years by myself. Well, let's say 43 maybe. I had a bit of help in the, in the early days. Um, mind blown. I was doing bananas completely wrong. If you go through the non-woody end, when you open it up, that nubbin thing that everyone sort of feels a bit icky about, the little black thing, yeah, um, he called it a rude word, I'm not going to call it a rude word. Um, that bit goes with it when you open it up. And it's just a joy to eat a banana. Not that they weren't joyous before. However, what I found out in researching this presentation for Web Directions was that monkeys chimpanzees, apes, don't generally live in places where bananas are, especially Cavendish bananas like us. So when you see a monkey and a banana together, in general, a human being has handed the monkey the banana. 
as a result, if the human being hands them the sticky end, they might eat that bit, or they might open it up from the new end, or because they're monkeys, they might just eat it from wherever the heck they find they can do it from. Um, so I learnt that I can change the way I look at things, that I thought that I'd been doing the right way for a very long time, and there are other ways that I can do things. Similarly, who knows what this is? You do, many people, some people do. Um, Tam does, thank you, another back. Yeah, and then it's not, pennies are starting to drop. It lets you do this. It lets you fold a shirt in a different way because apparently the way that we folded shirts for a long time was incorrect. There's a better way. So it's this. And I'm going to try and see if I can do it. And I haven't moved too far away, have I? Oh, hang on. Is that better? That's better for you. Um, I haven't got a very adroit setup, so I'm going to hope for the best. You grip about a third of the way down and about a couple of inches in with your wrong hand, if, assuming that the right hand is the correct hand, but you, the other hand. Then you lean down toward the hem and you bring it up towards the top and then you kind of flick it. Now for me, that was great. For you it's a bit less, less good, but for me it was great. Then you just lay it down on your cunningly placed chair, table, bed, ironing board, other surface that you'd fold ironing on, and you fold it over once, and it's done. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't invent it. Although I have tried other ways to do it, because sometimes when your shirts get a bit loved, they don't have the robustness to hold up to that sort of treatment, and they, they get a bit floppy. But there are apparently other ways to fold your laundry that won't necessarily change your entire life, but will make that little task a little bit better. Is that you? You sure? Okay. Number three. This one was less something that I learnt and more something that I had confirmed. And this may or may not split the room. It involves this. <laughs> there are some rooms you'll go into and talk to people about this and they have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Not this room. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Although, I hope that while I'm here, hang on. Thanks, Tam. Nice one. Um, I'm hoping that when we do, we don't split it further. So, 1891, the first patent for the uh, toilet paper and the toilet paper holder comes out in America, um, the American Patent Office. There's a prescribed way that we're supposed to use the toilet paper and the toilet paper holder. Um, <laughs> there's a very slim thing with toddlers and there's a, a slightly slimmer thing with cats as well. Um, <laughs> have you got cats who are toddlers? That's okay there. Um, there are many, many ways to hang the toilet paper. There's one correct way to hang the toilet paper. Uh, there may be others, but they're wrong. That's okay. Uh, I learnt that the way that I managed to sort of like, I just fell upon was the way that makes most sense. And it makes, many, it makes much sense. Even if the only way you get a flavor of how you're going to do it by going to posh hotels when they fold the little triangles into it for you. Um, the little triangles don't work so much when you fold it over the back to protect the paper from your toddler and or cat. Um, so I'd suggest possibly sidelining those sorts of impacts. So like put the kids in another toilet, have a pristine area for yourself where you can enjoy the right way to use toilet paper. It is. It was the fanciest one I could find. Who's typing that? Oh, that's, got, that's um, someone online, isn't it? Do you, do you guys remember how to talk? No? You're doing well with the head shaking, though. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I got. Um, we learnt that there are simple tasks that we can do that have simple alternatives and they can... Nah. And they can enrich the way we do things. And it's not necessarily going to make your entire life better if you learn a different way. Um, there may be a simple task that you find that does do that for you. For you. But in general, there, there can be different ways to look at things which we just don't take 
the, the time to think about t things we take for granted. And we're going to take a look at that tonight. We're going to look at something about CSS that may not be immediately obvious, but it will enrich the way we look at CSS, I'm sure. And we're going to do, be thinking about CSS, kind of simple alternatives that enrich. And we're going to do that through the medium of functional style sheets. Now, we all know, see, I was hoping that Sharpie would be here and that he would have found his voice. Because when you started CSS, were there functions? No, it was CSS. Yeah. I'm not talking about the functions that are native to CSS. I'm talking about an approach to CSS which we're taking from functional programming from other languages, um, Perl and Haskell and those sorts of things, which will allow you to change the way you look at your CSS and approach not only the way you code differently, but also the way you communicate with your team about it. And it will elevate the way they think about what you're doing. So how can we change CSS? We can change how we discuss it so that it becomes more obvious to those people outside of our team who haven't spent years like ourselves trying to understand the intricacies of CSS. Our definition will be that we're going to use the bottom one. We're going to say that uh, program, functional programming is a paradigm where methods are constructed by applying and composing functions. Those programmers are just poets, aren't they? Um, under functional programming, you'll find that functions are treated as first-class citizens. They are declarative, they are composable, they are testable, and that assignments that they use are immutable. Um, are there any, there's, there's a handful of folks in the room tonight who are both programmers and lovers of CSS. Is that, is that common? Do you, are you more, more of a programmer than CSS? No? Bit of both. Bit of both, excellent. Um, we're, gonna look, we're gonna take a look at functional programming. So functional programming is an approach that we're gonna use for the meaning of JavaScript. Again, JavaScript isn't a, a typically functional language, but we can use it functionally. So we're gonna use that to reflect on the fact that CSS isn't typically a functional language, but we can use it to change the way we approach our CSS and come up with, a, with an attitude that will allow us to communicate easily with those developers who do hold functional, CS functional programming uh, as a tenant. Uh, and the first thing is first-class citizens. So functions are first-class citizens, and that means that we can assign a function to a variable. Uh, it means that we can pass a function as a parameter through another function. And here we see the, the set timeout is the global function on the, uh, in the JavaScript space. And we're passing it this interior function, which is calling the, out, the out, outer function um, JavaScripty, fantastic, great. It's just the, the thing is that you're able to not just be restricted to handling functions in one way, you can pass them as parameters and you can use them as variables as well. And here we go, we're using ES6, the new, the new syntax for programming. The next step is that we need it to be declarative. And there are two variations with, with or it's an opposing uh, methodology between declarative and imperative. If we use a declarative approach, we tell you the end game. We tell you what we want you to do, not what you have to do to get there. So we're just saying, get to this direction. How you get there, that's up to you. Just go make sure you get there. If we're telling you an imperative way, though, we're giving you directions. We're telling you landmarks. We're telling you that if alternate routes you can take. We're telling you distances and times so you can check yourself. JavaScript is best when it's declarative and you don't bog down in the details. So here we're looking at some declarative JavaScript and we're looking in, in particular at this every method. We don't really know what it does. It sort of gives us a clue in, the, in the, the name of the function. It's telling us that it's going to do something to everything. Great, but we don't know what. Um, our alternative is to use imperative JavaScript, which is the older way we approached JavaScript. And it's, you told it everything you wanted it to do. And annoyingly, while the every method is a bit obfuscated, it doesn't really tell us what it's doing. When you actually are imperative, it's even more obfuscated and the, the, the code itself sort of wraps itself around its, around its, its, own, its own language. Um, we're going to move on though to composable. So we're looking at JavaScript, which is composable. And here we've got our jQuery slide. And I don't, I, when I started CJS well, this many years ago, I was really concerned that every presentation that we saw was going to be about jQuery. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of you people started coding CSS after jQuery had been retired. Um, that's great for the language. 
Um, this is a bit more like what it looks like, a, bit, a bit closer to what it looks like. We've got a, a method, we're passing it a selector, and we put, we're then telling it some functions. One will apply a CSS to it, and one will apply some, some, a class to it. The dollar thing at the time was this weird approach that no one fully understood. Um, we didn't really realize that you could use dollars and underscores and things as well as words, um, but not numbers, similar to uh, IDs in, in CSS. Somewhere hidden deep in the belly of jQuery was just a function though. It was simply a function that passed information in, in this case it was a selector in some context, and it just did the same thing as we were talking about before with our, our first class citizens, in that we had a local jQuery on the right hand side, it was passed up through a couple of uh, processes which assigned it to the dollar va variable and also jQuery. So we can write jQuery with a jQuery, but it's nothing very clever. The, the important thing is the jQuery itself wasn't providing us with this fluidity around code. JavaScript could already do it, but we had to come up with a new way of looking at it which allowed us to, to appreciate what the language is offering us. And that was that the dollar and away we went. And the, Next step up is going to be that our code should be testable. Um, everyone in the room loves testable code and uses TDD practices every day. You do? I do. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, well <laughs> I do too, I love it. Um, we may not necessarily look at JavaScript very often, but when we look over the shoulder of a JavaScript developer we're paired programming with, we'll see something like this. And not only is this bad because it's so small you can't read it, um, it's bad because it's so small you can't read it and it's incredibly long. One function that somehow you're supposed to be able to understand and get to do things over and over again, um, let alone want to change so you can get the code to do something different. We're going to look at this, a method which is a lot smaller. We're going to look at this new add function here and you'll see we've got some duplication going on in our scope and as these two pieces here are very similar. To make our code testable, one of the um, key goals is to make it as small as possible so that we can test just the thing we're trying to test. So in this case, what we're going to do is move these sorts of methods out of the scope into their own method. And you can see we're, we're calling the isNumber method from inside our add function now. We've now got two very small functions in the same way that we might have two very small uh, selectors. And those two functions together allow us to work with our testing platform and come up with a method that allows us to get clean tests to come through. Um, actually, we can even go cleaner than that. We can make sure that, that look, because we're not necessarily worrying about declaring our variables inside that scope, we can just use direct calls to our, uh, to our function. And we're getting as few lines as possible in our code, and we're getting great outcomes through. And those great outcomes allow us to write simple tests that say, two is the number, and we can check that or the sum of two and two is four, and we can check that. So we, again, we've got those different tenants, and our, our last tenant for our functional programming is that, our, is that our, uh, we'll use immutability. Immutability is quite straightforward. A variable, we can put a value to it, and we can change it. That's not immutable, that's mutable. We can make um, changes there. Our let variable is the same, we can do the same thing, but when we come down to our constant variable, um, we cannot change the code that goes into it. So we can rely on a constant being always the same no matter when we look at it. If we don't, we get a JavaScript error that I'm sure you've seen in your browser. Um, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it hot in here or is it just me? Uh, we've now seen that if we make functions that are treated as first class citizens where they are declarative, they're composable, they are testable, and our assignments are immutable, we come up with the tenants that allow us to call our code functional programming. Is that, is, is that a term you're used to, you're familiar with? Functional yeah. Yes. Am I close? Yep. Excellent, there you go. <laughs> Check. Um, where we'll go next though, we're gonna take the, the ideas from functional programming across to functional style sheets. And to do that, rather than using those tenants from functional programming, we're going to switch them a bit and apply some CSS properties to them. So our functions will still be treated as first class citizens. We're going to see if our statements can be declarative, our selectors are composable, our styles are testable, and lastly we're going to see if our styles are immutable. And if we can nail those five different tenants, then we should be able to stand up in front of uh, a stand-up and say to our cohort that 
yes, you're doing functional programming, but we're doing functional style sheets. And they can take, they, they will then understand more about what you're talking about and have a greater reliability in what you're doing. So first class functions in CSS, easy. Very interior is we're using a, a var function. We're using a variable in there. That variable could have a value, which is a function, because CSS loves doing that as well. We're passing that out to a calc function. We've got that whole process of passing values around throughout our code using, uh, using functions. So our code is a definitely uh, first class citizen. Is it declarative? CSS is highly declarative. We assume when we declare it that we know what's going to come out the other end, but we don't really know what's going to happen. So we can tell a color to use a hex value. We can tell the color to have RGB value instead. We can get a bit crazy and go with HSL. Um, or we can even use a color name, but we don't really know what's going to happen once the code leaves our server and goes to our users' devices. Uh, it could be a device which doesn't actually use color. It could be a device that somehow screws up what we think was the color, and we find that our, um, our design team are clamoring for us, and there's pitchforks and, and torches because we somehow screwed up the color. But we haven't. It's not the problem that we've done. It's just the fact that the devices don't necessarily have the same output all the time. Um, or in fact, we might find that our users don't use anything visual at all and they're actually hearing what we're saying. So the color that we spend hours laboring over isn't going to be of any interest to them. But we're not being imperative about the color. We're still being declarative. We're still just saying to people, take your best shot at being yellow, being goldenrod. That's declarative. Composable. We all know that CSS is highly composable. So here we've got a really bad selector. Um, I hope no one ever has to actually have to write one like this. But it's got four different components in it that allow us to compose together very highly composable um, selectors for our CSS. So we know that that's definitely the case. Um, there's been this modern change as well. So in, in addition to being able to compose selectors, we've got this, this push towards uh, things like Tailwind, where we use very small selectors and very small uh, styles linked together, and then we can then compose things together so that we're, not, we're no longer having just a class name which has many styles applied to it. We've got a one class and then one, one attribute coming through. Uh, in the good old days, when Tailwind first came out, it was actually called functional CSS. Um, we now know it more as an atomic version of CSS, so we're getting down to the very smallest parts of CSS. So if you get um, buttonholed by a, a, a cranky old developer, that's not what functional CSS is, you know the difference now. Now we're heading on to the realms of testability. Now you test your code all the time when you're doing um, proper, lang proper languages. Um, does anyone test their CSS? I had the pleasure of working <laughs> a little bit. I loved, when I was working with Fetch TV, we used to test, um, we'd get the components to tell us properties so that when you'd interact with it through uh, Selenium and you get it, to get it to change state, you'd ask the component itself to tell us what it would, like, what's your background color or what's your font size or those sorts of attributes. But then it's very straightforward, but slightly annoying if you don't love CSS in the first place. So I was able to champion that. Um, what I would have loved to have had, though, is a library like uh, Quixote, which gave you tools which allowed you to write the tests in the same way that you would write a more typical uh, programming test. Unfortunately, um, Quixote was written by someone who quite possibly wasn't highly focused on design. Um, I don't know where he came from. Um, but it was a really good idea. It just didn't quite get carried off. The code, though, it looks very similar to um, testing languages it might have read before. So we're saying that the nav bar, its top should equal the, the bottom header. So it's, it's just a fairly simple language that you're able to poll, uh, docu poll elements sorry, inside a, a, a construct and get them to tell you their, their, their properties. And those properties can then be tested. More interesting for us, to an extent, is the fact um, that we can do regression testing. So we can take snapshots of um, the interfaces that we're working with and to compare those two snapshots together to see if there's been a change. So um, often when you're trying to actually make changes, you'll get uh, a false results, which isn't really a false result, it's just a change to the way you, you're, you're approaching your code. So here it looks like it's terrible and it's, it's devastating because it's all gone red, um, but it's simply that the, that button has moved across. And then that may be, the button may be in the place where you want it to be now, 
And if that's the case, then you simply accept the new version as your source of truth. And the next time you do a comparison, your, um, your, your test platform will check against that. Um, and lastly, on the regression testing, you might be lucky and like, does that ring any bells, Isabel? Yeah, I think I'm right. <laughs> um, there are some platforms which allow you to have inbuilt regression testing. Um, you can see here that the, like, I was just about to walk one and a half meters to my right, but I chose not to because Tom would get very angry with me. Um, you can see that for some reason the tile hasn't loaded and the build of the product has stopped because we want to find out why that, what, that it's not there. And it's not the end of the world. Um, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, put your phone away, thanks. I'm sorry to interrupt your, your, your Googling. Um, or your Tindering. I could have gone there, but I didn't. Um, as soon as we find out what's happened to that tile, the process will run again, and we can use we can log this lock, lock this into our continuing integration uh, process, and our website will launch. Lastly, and the most contentious one is immutability. Can we get immutability in CSS? And um, the answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, there's nothing you can do in CSS that will allow you to stop. However, before we had TypeScript. And before we had constant variables, we used to have a convention. And that's the best we can do. So the convention was, if you see a variable name and it's in uppercase, don't change it. Once it's loaded in uppercase, just let it sit there. And that's the best we can do. And people love doing it, but IDEs wouldn't stop it and you couldn't test against it and things just broke. So people invented TypeScript because we couldn't trust each other to be nice to each other. Um, so if you, people like yourself, do you like TypeScript? You do? You like TypeScript? <gasps> I'm glad I'm at CSS, not CJS. <laughs> there would have been chairs thrown across the room. Sid TypeScript, we should do that. And there'd be like three people there. <laughs> no, they couldn't get in the room because all the types would be wrong. Anyway. Um, we don't actually have a construct in CSS which allows us to have immutable code. The best we can do is to not be bad citizens ourselves. Um, if we set up a class that people start to trust, and here we're using something which is quite small, it's not Tailwind-esque, but it's roughly Tailwind-like, um, don't just simply add something odd in. Uh, it may not affect what you're doing because you may not have anything which, which touches on that style property, but in three months' time, a new release might come out and your code gets merged into a different, a different branch and suddenly everything turns red and no one knows quite why. Sorry? No, I can't. <laughs> Is that better? That's better. And better still would be to make the class a bit more a bit more predictable. So if we can come up with a way that we can happily write predictable uh, styles and not change them on the way through, we can at least tip our hat towards immutability. It won't be purely immutable. Um, we can still get pulled up on it, but it's the closest we can get. And we've done it. If we're able to change some of our CSS focuses so that we change to those practices, we can then stand up in front of programmers with big beards and anoraks and other uh, stereotypes that we won't go into. Um, and we can say to them that we're working with, and they'll, they'll have a better, he hasn't got a beard. We can say that we, we haven't actually got functional programming, but we're getting close. We're functionally functional at least. Um, our functions are treated as first class citizens, our statements are declarative, our selectors are composable, our styles are testable, and our styles are immutable. And we should get, to an extent, happy developers. Um, except we don't. Mm. And th there are reasons for that. And that's, we, it's not just those functional things which we have to focus on. There are a couple of other things which we can add in, which will make it easier for those people to accept us into the fold. Um, and we're going to get a mascot back. He's going to help us again. This time only with two examples. The first is that we need to leverage CSS. Now, it may seem odd to tell people in a CSS meeting 
that one way to be better CSS developers is to use more CSS. But I don't think that everybody does. I don't think we should always use all the CSS that comes out that's brand new. But what we should look at doing is if we're, if we're joining two uh, older concepts together to tr that can be better replaced by something which has come out recently in CSS, when we start touching that code and, and updating things, we need to start adopting those, package, those processes. Uh, this year, when I.O. came out uh, in around June, May, sorry, um, there were these things. So I went the wrong way. If we go back, the first one's one of the most important things. That container queries is going to change the way a lot of you do your CSS. Um, style queries are OK. Has is pretty great. Um, since the first time I wrote font color equals red, I wanted to not, I wanted to change the color of the parent as well. And now with that, you can. And that, that's going to change the way we do the CSS. And I don't, I don't expect everyone to use all 20 of the properties that came out this year, but when you get a chance to, adopt them yourselves so that you're not laboring the rest of your team with having to do some, something in JavaScript or something on the back end or something with an image that you can better do in CSS yourselves. Um, and it's not just the new techniques which we need to look at. Sometimes there are things that are a bit older that we need to consider. We might have a fantastic title on our page, um, but we don't think that necessarily white on a black background is just going to grab our audience. Um, so we might change it to something a bit more vibrant. Uh, but then we realize that nowadays, CSS is fantastic at doing gradients. Well, actually, almost what works. Um, does everyone in the room know how to get that gradient into the other bit of text? It's easy. Um, first of all, we've got a couple of methods. So we're going back again to our, the, our grounding, and we're saying we've got some functional CSS going on. Um, but more importantly, we're looking at background clip and text. So we, rather than applying the background to the, to the area that the text is sitting in, we're applying it to the text itself. So we get a combination of gradient and title, and that's really fun. Um, we don't have to go to talk to the design team to get a new graphic output because it changed the size or something. We're not talking to the back-end developers to make sure we can do an upgrade. It's just written in the CSS, and it's lovely. And because it's CSS, we can change it to anything which is the background. Um, we can really compel our audience to like change the, 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 the whole attitude to how they're looking at CSS. Um, and it's easy. We can just change it. Here we've switched over from using the linear gradient to just using a URL to put an image in the back of there. Very, very straightforward. And of course, because of CSS, we can change size easily. Um, we can put other things behind there. Because, of course, as everybody knows, CSS is awesome. <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. Um, number two is code bundling. One of the biggest gripes that you'll have with your development team is that your CSS files get huge. Um, someone will ditch a component and start the, file, the, the styles themselves stay around. When you put something else into your code base, that legacy CSS gets in the road. Then you start finding things like, oh, we'll just make this one important. Or no, actually, no, we'll make the other one important, unless it's in that case, in which case we'll put two things that are important. And actually, we, made it, but we should move the CSS selector away from an external um, source to the element itself, because that's got higher specificity. Um, and don't mention specificity to back-end developers, because they can't spell it or say it or understand what it's about, which is why they like Tailwind. Um, <laughs> but code bundling. We can do our CSS, we can call it in through an external link, we can call it in through a style attribute, we can add it as uh, properties in a parameter uh, on an element itself, or we can put it in through JavaScript. Um, at which point in time, because I've read this before, I know that the, our mascot is going to ask us the question, is that CSS? Does anyone know how JavaScript, with its CSS and JS and all those sorts of fun things they're doing and telling us that we're all doing it wrong, how CSS changes the way that a page is styled. Do you th then we think that JavaScript can just change colors and backgrounds and fonts? Or do they understand that CSS is what JavaScript uses? So the thing that all of the JavaScript developers which are saying, don't use JavaScript, or don't use CSS, leave it up to us, they're just relying on the language that we use ourselves. So when we're talking about setting the style color, that's just using pure CSS. So 
Maybe, don't rub that in, but know that all those, the, the uh, hoity-toity JavaScript folks uh, are relying on the languages that we write to get the style coming through. Um, and to beat them again further at their own game, this is an import statement which you'll see and it's using uh, style components to make the code, it, it's how they've, they've wrested CSS from us and stuck it in their own, their own area of the, the code base. And it, they liked it for a while, but they found that it was prob problematic um, because of this. Uh, don't look at it, it's terrible. Um, it's, but it's real. It's from HubSpot, which is huge, um, nasty. We can break it down, we can put it into smaller includes, but it's still hard to control, hard to maintain. Uh, but there is a better way, and that's to use Webpack, which is a tool that the backend developers use to bundle up the, the, the websites. Um, this is a typical way you will, you will start a, a, a React application in JavaScript. If you include this one line, import your style.css, you'll find that Webpack can now handle the bundling as well. So it doesn't natively do it, you need, you need a couple of uh, helper applications to come through, but you can use the tools that the front end and back end developers are using um, to help us get wins in CSS. So if we're doing that and we're using uh, CSS loader, it will actually go through all of your code and find the import rules and, and, and collate the code together. Um, you can use style loader to then inject the code back into the, 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 uh, the JavaScript that you're using. And the result is that with a couple of entries into a config file that your JavaScript developers are used to seeing, you start to add CSS into the mix. And the real benefit, uh, in addition to that, you can actually include an exclude file so that if, they're having to, if they have to have some CSS in there that they're controlling themselves, they, that can run alongside of the code that we're trying to control. Um, the, the big benefit is that the CSS code lives alongside the JavaScript code for the component, and when you delete the component, you delete the CSS. So there's no longer any legacy code, there's nothing hanging around that you're not actually in control of. Uh, it's not, Webpack by itself can't do it, but it's very straightforward as we've seen to add the necessary levers in to make it a tool that you can call on. That, to an extent, has helped help us come full circle. When we came back from, uh, from COVID at CJS, one of the first presentations that we had was a guy talking about writing pure CSS into his, into his JavaScript application. Um, because they realized while we were away, the Tailwind was a good step in that direction, that critical CSS was lovely, that you would put a small amount of code on top of your document to control the way that the first uh, page renders. But they realized that, in essence, Going back to first principles, where you had CSS and JavaScript um, and HTML all working together would be the, the, the best way forward. So we've got HTML was, was there when Sharpie was a kid. We added in some CSS. Um, we added also on top of that some JavaScript, but then we, we lost focus on the game and suddenly we realized that JavaScript folk were trying to do everything themselves. But we started to win background and that's what the whole process is. This whole attitude to um, adopting processes that the functional programmers can understand means that we can start winning back some ground, we can start taking back control over how we write how HTML and CSS, and we can start seeing that in things like Astro where you're writing pure CSS into a document which is then split out and put into files as, that you might normally see in your application structure. Um, are our developers happy? Um, are they have got joy? Well, no. Um, the reason for the lack of joy isn't what you're doing now though happily, it's unfortunately the fact that they start with Webpack, um, they might add Vite or Vite or Vite on top of that, they don't quite know how to pronounce it because they never actually talk to each other, they only type into Twitter. Um, they might use Gulp and they might have to use Gulp, uh, Grunt as well which they don't really enjoy using. On top of that they're going to worry about Node, uh, if they're not using Node, they're probably using Dino um, which is Node mis. Ah, it's an anagram. Yeah. There you go. But they couldn't quite work out that it's spelt Dino, but they want to pronounce it kind of Dino. So they've got, I don't think it's a worm. I think it's supposed to be like a brontosaurus. Um, I'm not really sure. Anyway, on top of that process, they've then got JavaScript, which is coming in. Do they use CommonJS? Have they got ESM? Are those compatible? Of course not. Um, they never get to rest. Uh, 
So as a result, it's probably not us that's annoying them the most. There are other factors in play. So even though we do the best we can do, we probably can't get them to be completely joyful. What we can best hope for is to at least minimise some of their anger um, to an extent. Um, but we still have at our heart the idea that we're like that joy is our goal. Um, and if we don't worry about some of the stuff that the, those poor chaps have to do, I think we did it. We've managed to make sure that our code um, has been reframed. We now have functional style sheets that are um, where our functions are treated as first class citizens. Our statements are declarative, composable, testable, and our styles are immutable. And I thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>